welcome to the Conversations on Healing podcast, where host Shay Bider speaks with renowned healthcare leaders, practitioners, and thought leaders to explore the world of wellness, the incredible powers of self-care, and what it truly means to heal today. Join us on this journey to become more whole, healed, and connected. Well, welcome, Sam. It's so good to have you on the Conversations on Healing podcast. Delighted that you're a guest today. Thanks so much for having me. (laughs) It's going to be a fun episode. I love this topic because not a ton of people know about it. And the way that you are weaving kind of graphic um, artistry into medicine in this field of now graphic medicine, um, I think is just so cool. So I wanted to start off, I thought, in kind of a very practical way, which is to explain a little bit about what is graphic recording, what is graphic medicine, like what are we going to be talking about today for some of our listeners who might not be familiar with this or how it could be helpful in their own lives. Yeah, I guess there's a few different kind of overlapping subjects that we might uh, talk about today. Yeah, so maybe we can start with graphic recording because that's what I do for my work. Um, for all my life, I've done lots of art and lots of writing. And I found out about 10 years ago in about 2012, that there's this emerging field around the world called graphic recording, where um, people who usually, well, I guess there's different ways to do it. But the way I usually do it is by taking notes at an event where someone's giving a presentation. So maybe it could be a meeting or a big conference where there's a keynote speaker, and you really want to remember what that person's talking about. You can always write down the meeting minutes and just sort of record the words that they said. But it's such it's so much more engaging and memorable if you can record the meeting minutes with pictures too. So graphic recorders will attend an event uh, in person usually, or these days, uh, often I'm doing it more remotely, and with a really big poster that could be about eight feet long, and write down the keynotes and the highlights from what's being said at that event. But in weaving together, like you use that word weaving with Um, words and pictures so that when you look at those notes you're really going to remember a bit more and be more interested to take a look in the first place at what that uh, information was about. So that's what I've done for about 10 years with many different organizations all over the place writing down notes and drawing pictures to help people uh, share the message of what they're what they're talking about what they want to let people know about and because I was doing that work I kind of discovered along the way this field called graphic medicine, which is another kind of emerging movement around the world where pictures are really helping with healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I love that this actually was a very personal story for you, how you got into graphic medicine and took your artistry to apply it into the medical field. And so I'd love for you to share just a little bit about your personal journey that led you into this field. Yeah, I feel like there's been lots of different, it's like many little streams that all flowed into one big river. And now graphic medicine is where I spend most of my time. But it, I think the graphic medicine, so just to understand what that is all about, um, a physician in England, Dr. Ian Williams, coined that term also about 10 years ago, the term graphic medicine, which he imagined as the intersection of comics and healthcare. So comics in particular are the, was sort of the the impetus of for uh, thinking about graphic medicine. But graphic medicine can also be a, a bunch of different things. And for some, t- sometimes it's used as a, as a teaching tool, like using, using pictures, for example, at a medical school. But for myself, it was more of a lived experience where I have been a family caregiver for a few folks, but mostly for my mom who has Parkinson's for quite a long time now. And because of my work with words and pictures and telling stories and that kind of stuff, I ended up just using pictures to help with my own health care and my own, like my caregiving needs, I guess. That's kind of how it started for me. Yeah, that's great. And I wanted to share with our listeners that we also have a video of this podcast episode that some of you might choose to watch on YouTube. And we may actually have Sam show a few like of her images so you can actually see it. If you tune into the Integrative Touch YouTube channel, you'll be able to catch that side of it. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, you're seeing it right now. (laughs) Um, So yeah, just to let people know that's available. Do you want to discuss, there's a beautiful kind of moment of one of the early drawings you did when you were with your mom in the hospital and you needed to leave because you wanted to be with your children and, 
and yet you didn't want to leave her because you were worried that her caregivers wouldn't take care of her properly. And so you came up with this like light, bu light bulb kind of an idea of how to create a drawing that would communicate in your absence what her needs were. Um, so I thought that might be useful for you to share that as an example. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And there's a there's a picture that I have sent along. If you want to put it up on the screen when I'm talking about it, it's called Help for Jocelyn, because that's what I was imagining when I thought about my mom who'd been having multiple uh, health issues and she was in the hospital um, at a time when she was taking a lot of medication and she was pretty unwell and she wasn't really able to communicate for herself very well. She was having some hallucinations and in particular, she kept leaning off to the left. And that wasn't a symptom that was even on her chart that wasn't something that was that wasn't why she was at the hospital at that time but it was really getting in the way and i felt like if people weren't aware that that was a problem for her and that wasn't like her usual way of doing stuff it might not even get noticed so then i drew a picture that said you know help for jocelyn she leans to the left and i gave some suggestions like just support her left side this is how she can sleep and this was just one of a few notes that i just stuck up on the bulletin board in the hospital room where she stayed so that i could just hope that somebody would see that message and you know, get get the information that was needed without me being there. And it, it, it worked really well. Then after that, I started to do it with lots of lots of different things. Mm -hmm. It's such a, a beautiful idea that you had. And I've thought about this too, like individually in our healing work, because we were going to be opening a healing center. And for years, we've done healing retreats and different kinds of programs. And we always created these lanyards that we would give to kids because we work with a lot of kids who communicate using body language, but don't communicate using words. But we wanted to give like their uh, volunteers and their buddies and their the medical team also like a little snapshot on what their needs are and what they like and what's important to them and what they can or can't eat and how they like to be positioned and what feels good and what doesn't. And we played with all these different styles of doing it, but we never played with creating like a visual, almost like a little picture book or something that would walk people through that. And because of your work, it's inspired me to think about, could we create like a little picture book that would kind of go as part of their lanyards or something like that oh, that's um, so neat. for each of our kids, because they all have these incredible you know stories of how they do like to be cared for and what is important you know like we'll have certain kids that are highly highly sensitive um because often when your visual system is impaired and your auditory system is impaired ironically interestingly fascinatingly you're actually much more sensitive because of that level of impairment other aspects of your kind of inner sensory awareness are developed. And so a lot of those kids can feel people further away and they need to be approached in a much more gentle manner. And they want you to make contact in a certain way where maybe you very gently bring your fingertips kind of to theirs or you place your hand under theirs so it feels like they have more kind of power or control. Um, and so there's all these subtleties that often the parents know so well, right? Because they're living with this human being every day and they know how to take care of their child. But when we learn that from them, then we want to like quickly convey it to their caregivers. Um, and so I was thinking, oh, your work, it's such a cool idea for how we could start to develop something like that as a, like a a very useful, but also kind of a fun way to convey the information. I thought, I think it's really brilliant. So I, I love so many things about what you're doing. <laughs> well, it can be, it can be so useful in different applications. Like as I think particularly as a time saver, that's what I really found for me in the times that I've used it. Um, for example, when I went to see a family doctor one time who actually turned out to be my new family doctor, who I really love now, but the first time I met him, I felt like I was coming in to see him for just a, just some symptom of something that you know, it wasn't that big a deal. But at the same time, I was caring for like six family members who all were like all the family elders in my life were all dealing with different health issues. And my, we were looking after multiple people with multiple complicated things. And this was really in the background of all, you know, whatever like little rash or wart on my finger, whatever those symptoms were that showed up on the surface, it was really because of the underlying stuff. So while I was in the waiting room, I just quickly drew a family tree. Like I drew, here's a little happy face. That's me. Or actually it wasn't that happy of a face. And then I drew like, you know, parents and uncles and all the different people just in a little, you know, just little faces and little words underneath saying like, this one had dementia, this one has Parkinson's, this one has cancer. And then when my doctor came in, I said, 
you know, this is a little snapshot of what's going on right now. And it was like a five second quick glance to say like, oh, there's some context here around why you're seeing me in this office today and why you have this symptom that you might have. And it wasn't anything that needed to be like, we didn't have to have a long talk and write down a long history. And I had to explain and also talk about that stuff that can be hard to talk about. I was thinking when you spoke about those children that you want to use um, some tools that can avoid the the awkward or the challenging moments of communication where just in one minute you, you want to connect, but you also have to somehow get through those, those things that are hard to communicate about. So mm -hmm. if a picture can do that for you, it saves you all of that, you know, potentially challenging communication and you can get right to the thing you need to try to do. And what I love too about this story you just described about how you drew kind of your family tree is that you know, so many of us, we've gone to the doctor, we've filled out the forms. It says, did your grandma have this? Did your, you know, yeah. you're, you're like yeah. reading it all out, but in this very boring form that the doctors looked at a million times and they're looking again, like, okay, do they have the history? <laughs> you know, yeah. but it gets kind of like, oh, you know, it's, it takes out, I think a lot of the humanity, but somehow in that moment, I would imagine by you drawing that tree and then giving like really a part, a different part of the physician's brain and opportunity, because I think probably in seeing it, that shifted them a little more into right brain thinking because it's artistic and creative. So it probably also helped them to understand you and your family in a more humanistic way. Uh, and I, I love it's, that. It's hard for the, for the physicians too, because when you think about those, those forms you have to fill out when you go to the doctor or whatever appointment and they ask you like, you know, has anyone in your family had this particular symptom or, you know, what's your history? What's the, have you had any medical procedures? Then when the person who's reading that at the other end, no matter how faithfully you fill that out, for them, it's also like, okay, here's another big information dump of all this stuff in somebody's messy handwriting or, you know, whatever way they've communicated it, that must be hard for them to wade through as well. So if it can help at both ends, then it's, I think it's a win, it's a win on either side. Absolutely, I agree. And a piece that I wanted to make clear to our listeners, because some people might be like, oh, I can't draw. Cause you know, there's, it's sad that so many of us somehow learn like we can't draw, we can't sing and we can't dance. Well, it's so silly. <laughs> Everyone can draw, sing and dance. Like <laughs> we just have to let that go. Mm -hmm. But, you know, many people kind of internalize that message. And what's cool about your work is it's in this comic style that has a lot of freedom to be very simple. You don't have to be as skilled as you are. Um, to do this. And so I'd love to have you speak a little bit to that, like the freedom and you don't have to be a fantastic artist to be able to, to do this. Uh, <laughs> it really don't have to be, it really can be like a, a happy face or a stick figure because you just want, you really don't want it to be a fine art. You want it just to draw in the eyes of the person who's used to looking at a plain old chart. But in this case, they're going to say, oh, what's this? This is something different. Actually, I was just going to add, I went to see a family counselor a bunch of times when my kids were little. And then I called them again in the last couple of years to follow up about something. And I said, oh, I'm not sure if you remember me. You know, we were there a few years ago. And they said, oh, no, we remember you. You you always do those pictures. And the receptionist said, I don't understand the, the notes that the, the doctors here usually write down. But I understood your notes because they were, you know, they were, they were just presented in just the way I described with that kind of family tree. So they were more accessible and they were more memorable. So it doesn't, it, but it really wasn't fine art. It really is just you know, pairing your words with an image. And it may not even be a picture of a person, although a picture of a face, even if it's just like eyes and a little smile or a picture of a stick person is something that people relate to because we're all people. So when you see a person, you feel a little bit of a connection there, but it could also just be a little circle around that, or it could be a little, some lines radiating out or some little squigglies or a bright color just to make your, to draw in your eye and make you pay attention. Like, why are these words important? So it really is not about being an artist. Just luckily for me, I, since I worked as an artist anyway, it just occurred to me to maybe use that tool, but it doesn't have to be, you know, beautiful art. Right. And I also know, I wanted to ask you more about this too, that sometimes you're using this as a way for people to tell their personal story. So let's say maybe they've had a hard legacy of illness or trauma or difficulty and, uh, you know, there's journaling, there's therapy, there's tools out there that we can all use. But another tool is to find a relationship to drawing your story, to telling your story in a simple way, but through images. So I wanted to ask you a little more about that for some of our listeners who might want to try embracing that themselves. Yeah, 
Boy, I don't even know where to start. Like I, I started writing comics in my 20s because I was given an assignment when I went to art school for a while, like write some comics so or keep, keep a, a drawing journal. So I started writing about what was going on in my own life. And I soon found that this was a really great, I guess it almost like a therapy for myself just to get things out of my system or to, you know, write those things that, you know, young people write in their journals about their heartbreak or their stress about work or whatever. And this became a really great outlet for you know, and, and in graphic medicine, particularly, this can be a great outlet for your health, you know, considerations or your health fears or hopes or journey, but it could be about anything. Like it can be just as helpful to draw about something as it is to write about it in a journal. Uh, but it turns out that when you're using this in a healthcare context, it can actually be really useful for, um, for yourself and for your caregivers because of a few reasons. One reason that I really wasn't expecting but this turned out to be really important to me was uh, when I was keeping, um, when I started writing comics about my son. So when my first son was born, I felt like I really won't have time to do any fancy fine art stuff here. It's gonna be really basic and simple, keep it realistic. And I started writing these little comics once a day about my son. And I just, I, that I really gave myself permission to be messy, to not make them beautiful, to not try to do anything, you know, that had to ever be seen by anybody. And they were just like a little kind of getting it out of my system for myself and a little something to remember. So in this case, I wrote about how my son, when he was about three years old, was afraid of big, loud, scary noises. And so it, I wrote in this little comic about him, you're afraid of loud, automatic flush toilets. So we always do a check first. And in this comic, we, my son said to the coffee shop folks, like, you have the best favorite bathroom in all Calgary. That's the city where we live. So this was just like a funny little anecdote. I'm like, these coffee shop guys were perplexed by my son. But what ended up happening was, not only is it a fun little memory for me, it became really helpful, these comics, which I kept for about five years, the first of his five years of his life, um, to have a developmental record of the things that happened to him. You know, what kind of things scared him? When did he start walking? When did he start? What were his favorite foods? What... You know, these little things that I had not at all thought of keeping track of in any kind of systematic way or with any kind of medical reason. But later when we started to, you know, investigate, you know, how he was developing now, he's 13 years old. And any doctor would say like, well, when was this happening? What were those milestones that may really make a difference? We could look back in these little pictures and find them. So keeping a journal might just be a good outlet at the time for you to get your feelings out. But you might find that later these are sort of inadvertent records of something that might be really useful to know. I, I think that's so important to share that it gives you kind of this legacy, you know, of these images that were relevant at different stages of development. And you, when you think about kids and development and that trajectory, it's hard to think back what happened, but if you can see it, yeah. sure, that's lovely. Um, I know another piece of this, which I, I heard you share with me previously that I think is really important to understand is that to be a good graphic recorder and a note taker, which you've been doing now for many, many years, um, that you feel you really had to deepen your capacity to listen. And so I want to understand that the relationship between deep listening and then being able to transform what you hear into images. Yeah, thank you. I think like I, I started to be a listener maybe when I went to school and I had to take notes. Actually, it's funny whenever I've gone to a conference full of people and I'm and I'm taking notes on what the, what's being said sometimes people will say oh that's amazing how can you take notes like this so quickly in real time and draw all these pictures and sometimes it's like a conference full of you know medical experts and I'm thinking like we all went to medical school you must be you must be good at taking notes too you ha you have to be you know maybe you don't outwardly show them to the whole world but many of us have that skill that we might not even realize we're applying whenever we're doing our work because you have to Put, you put your attention on that thing you're trying to retain and then hopefully make some kind of outward you know realization of that by the work that you're doing from that thing that you just were learning about i guess maybe the the piece that's missing for people say you go to a meeting and you have to listen to some you know information and then you sort of soak it up and then you leave but that might get lost a little bit and yet unless you're the one who's in charge of taking the meeting minutes or unless there's something that you really write down or record or whatever way works for you to really um, keep that in. And so I, I think that if if everybody had to be a graphic recorder, um, you know, especially if it's about a subject that they don't even know anything about, really have to turn up your listening dial because you're, you're, you're listening for something that's not only, you know, sort of soaking up what you're hearing, letting it wash over you. You have to listen for that. What's that 
takeaway? What's that memorable thing that's going to be useful that we're going to need to remember later? So probably just by listening and practicing so many times trying to hear that message in that maybe long presentation or a full day of conference meetings or whatever, I've started to develop a little bit of an extra ear for what's the takeaway in that message? What's the thing we want to remember? Mm. And having to write that down in a way that people will be able to um, use later on, um, that's become sort of my skill in my work. So yes. listen, but listening is where it starts from. It's not about drawing pictures and being an artist at all. It's about knowing what, what should that message be? And that's only something you get from the listening part of it. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting because this moment in history where we have this real change in terms of how our lives are interacting with technology, right? And so we're busier than ever. We have more notifications that are coming our way, you know, kind of more things constantly vying for our attention. It can be so much more challenging for people to actually be fully present and to really listen to another human being. And I was thinking about this because, you know, because we're going to be creating a healing center, we want when people come in for them to be met in a certain kind of a way when they walk in the center. And so I've been watching like check-in areas, right? Just to see like, how does that look? So I, I went to a yoga studio and I just watched the check-in. I just sat on a couch and watched, you know, like hundreds of people probably <laughs> checking in for various yoga classes. Um, and I did something similar at my daughter's school where I just, I watched the people coming in and what was mm -hmm. fascinating. And I think it's just a reflection of modern culture to some degree is how many people kind of almost like bumbled in the door. <laughs> they were, you know, disheveled and not very present. And you could tell hurried and sort of scrambling and, you know, and then fascinatingly, the way that most people interacted with the other human being that was typically kind of on another side of a desk, right, was very transactional. So hmm. it was like, I need, you know, and it didn't always use those words, but it was very much like, give me or I need or like an exchange, almost like you were going to an ATM <laughs> or to a cell phone and you're like, okay, I want this information, give me that. And I was thinking about, it was just like the most amazing thing to watch this happen over and over. And I don't think I saw at one of the places, I don't think I saw one person say what I would consider like a kind and thoughtful greeting, which was just like a, you know, hello, how are you today? Where they were noticing that there was this other person on the other side of the counter who had feelings and thoughts. And I watched how hard those people were working. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is a tough job. And no one was really like tuning in to see how, how are you right now? How are you in this moment? And it literally made me think I wanna send flowers to those people because I just thought, oh, this is super hard in a culture that's, that's like collectively caught up in um, self-involvement and we're, we're getting really um, disconnected from noticing how other people are doing. And I thought about how that happens in medicine so often, right? I see it with well-intentioned nurses, but who they're so buried in all of the record, you know, the electronic medical record, all, everything that has to be captured and that and I need to do this and I have to do this and, I'll, and I have 25 things I have to do in the next hour and I can't get them all done. And so to the patient, I'm only going to get to just do it. I don't even get to like see how you're feeling. And I feel like anything that can slow those patterns down, and obviously we still need systems levels change, but I think some of your work could be part of that systems level change, you know, to rehumanize, to reconnect, to pause a little bit, to remember this is a person here who has feelings and needs, and I need to attend to those in a responsive and kind way. Um, and so I think we're up against a lot of forces culturally, but I do think your work has some potential to shake us up a little and remind us, wait, these are real people with real lives, real families, real stories, real histories. And how do I remind myself when I'm getting like all caught up in my own nonsense <laughs> to pay attention? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wish that 
systems level is I think that's the way you need to implement some of the changes that pictures can help with for them to be effective. But until we get there, maybe I could share another image. And I know this one's called foot rests. That's how I labeled the image. Because this is one that I have been using for my mom recently at her long-term care where she lives. And I just thought of it when you're talking about how these nurses are so busy. There's one thing at my at my mom's long-term care where because nurses are so busy, you cannot, you cannot make an appointment. You can't say, I need to talk to a nurse about a question at, you know, do you have time at 1030 tomorrow morning? Because you don't know what that nurse will be doing on that day. So because I, and then I, I feel so bad to call them and say, hey, uh, do you have time to talk about this question about my mom's care? Like right in the middle of, you know, you're probably giving somebody some lunch right now and you, you know, you haven't had a chance to switch gears to think about this one. So we made this picture about something that my mom identified as a problem, um, which was that she is a, she's a once in a while wheelchair user. She doesn't use the wheelchair all the time. And so she doesn't have the foot rests on the wheelchair because usually if she's sitting there, she might want to pad her own feet along the floor to move along herself. But if for some reason she needs to get pushed along the hallway, if those foot rests are not there to rest her feet on, her feet will bump up onto the floor and she could fall right out of the wheelchair. But you know, a, a staff member might not know that. They might not realize that her feet are just dangling there and they might just start giving her a push. So we made this, uh, we thought about what about using a picture that would say, stop, don't push unless the foot rests are on. And we thought we'd draw these three, these three little pictures, the one that shows that here's what you don't do. There's an X and there's a picture of a push that bumps my mom's feet. And then there's a check mark with the one that you put the foot rests underneath so the feet can rest and then you give a push. And then we shared this with my mom's physio and OT, the occupational therapist, who confirmed like, yeah, that looks like, you know, the right way to do it. And like that nurse who's putting the fit rests on looks like her posture is okay. She's bending down on her knee. She's, you know, that's the right way to do this. And then they actually took these pictures and shared them with their staff at the staff meeting. Mm. And the staff members identified, you should write underneath, uh, please remove the foot rests afterwards, because, you know, we don't want to have the foot rests always on there if my mom later wants to walk along her wheelchair herself. So this little picture was just the result of a collaboration of my mom, who, who thought of the idea, the nursing staff, the physio, the OT, and uh, the long-term care manager. So I don't really know how much good this picture is really going to do, but I loved that it was the result of a collaboration and we ended up putting it up on the wall of my mom's room. So I'm hoping we don't need to make an appointment or sit down and have some phone call at a time when the nurses are busy and overwhelmed. Instead, when they happen to have a free minute and they have the capacity to think about something new, they can come in and look on the wall and, and notice this. So I'm hoping again, it saves the time for somebody who's already really busy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I think that's Fabulous. And I could see, you know, putting like for someone who has occasional use of a wheelchair, putting something like that on the wheelchair too would be. That's, another, yeah, right? that's what we thought. We thought of putting it right on the back of the wheelchair where you'd see it before you start pushing. Right. But the nursing staff, again, they were not so sure if that would be the right place for them. So they asked me to put it on the wall of the room. Yeah, It didn't make as much sense to me, but they, that's their input. So I'm. Exactly. it has to be a collaborative, uh, you know, result. Absolutely. And that is the right way to figure these things out. Um, I also know that one of the ideas you've had is that using images could be a part of an admissions process. So when you're going into a new facility, whether that's a hospital or a long-term care facility, but that we could actually weave this into the admissions process. What ideas do you have around how that might look? Yeah, that's just like a little idea of my own that I really, I just keep thinking how useful it would be. Um, and it, maybe it starts back from a really old story of how a long time ago I was an exchange student. I went to Germany for a year when I was a teenager, and I had to live with a family who didn't know me and I didn't know them. And so I drew some pictures of my family back in Canada and a few things about me, and I put them up on the wall so that we, they would remember, because I, I wanted them to know, like, you know, who, who was I? Who, what were the things that were important to me? And uh, I found this was really useful because I had, like, this busy family who... Like they, they figured out who I was, but they couldn't keep track of all those relatives they'd never met or these things in another country they'd never been to. So having those little pictures up on the wall was like a useful kind of like something to jog their memory. And even it was like a bit of a conversation starter when we kind of were like, we don't really know each other. What are we going to talk about with each other? So I found that if you use the same technique when you're coming to a new place in a healthcare setting, it can just be a good little conversation starter and something to break the ice and maybe to even convey some important information as well. So I'm imagining if, say, and I'll, I'll use the context of long-term care, because that's my experience with my mom, you come to a new long-term care facility, or maybe just a, you know, a residence of assisted living, wherever you're going to be in a new place, 
um, it takes a while to get to know you and to feel at home there. So when you're having your admission and maybe someone's there to find out about you, okay, what are your medical needs? What medications do you take? What, uh, you know, what are the those sort of facts and figures you have to find out about somebody? Like, what's your age? What's your citizenship? Those kinds of things. What if there were also some questions that were asked about some things that were important to you that were kind of easily conveyed, just a little handful of important things like, uh, and like this could, this could be up to the person who's in that residence. Like, I really, really don't like broccoli and I really love music and I I don't know, maybe there's something that just makes that particular person just so happy. Like I really love Bob Dylan. I would, if I moved to a long-term care facility now, I think I'd want people to know I really like Bob Dylan because that would be a great conversation starter for anybody who really doesn't like or does like the music of Bob Dylan. We could right away start having a conversation. So it could be the, the resident, the new resident who suggests a few things about themselves that's important to them. Or if maybe they're an elderly person with dementia, it could be a family member who suggests on their behalf, oh, you know, my mom, uh, really loved, uh, I don't know, she used to live on a farm and she's really good at some skill, like whatever, whatever those little details are that only that family member would know. And then maybe in that admissions process, there's somebody who's sitting there with a sketchbook and who's writing down those little snippets of information together with a picture, just like I did at the doctor's office. It's still, we still have the words, we still write Bob Dylan, and then we have a little picture of some guitar or some little musical symbol that will give people the inclination to look at those words and to read what they say. And then maybe we can stick those into the chart or up onto the wall of that person's room. So when a new um, caregiver, like the new doctor or the nurse who's never met you before comes into the room, they can quickly look up onto the wall or into that chart and say, oh, Mrs. So-and-so, she really, um, I don't know, she once traveled to Italy. Okay, let's ask her. So I hear that you really love traveling to Italy or whatever that little detail is that they chose. Then that just may spark some some trust and some uh, interest and some breaking the ice between those new people. So I, I wish that could be part of the process. Of course, you want your medicine, you want your you mm -hmm. know, information about the facts and figures too, but this might just add a little element that would make things easier. I would love to see this in rounds. I would love yeah. to see like a team, you know, the team of doctors as they're discussing the patient, like, oh, she really loves Bob Dylan. You know, like that, that's part <laughs> <Right>? of it. <laughs> because it doesn't in any way negate that we'll get to all the hard science, all the important, right. but it's like, it just reminds you of the depth of who that individual is. And I think it also does something else, which I am constantly an advocate for this in my own life and work, which is we don't heal just through science, right? Like, oh, that would be fabulous if that's all it took, but oh my gosh, that is not all that it takes, right? It's not just yeah. a pill, it's not just a surgery. It's also the things we love that keep us alive. It's the people we love that keep us alive. It's There's now really interesting studies that if you're holding the hand of a loved one during a painful procedure, you experience less pain. They can actually see it in a brain scan that your brain is less triggered. Literally, you feel less pain when you're holding the hand of someone that you love. And so this is not, just, healing is not just about science. That's an important component, a very useful, very beneficial aspect of what is needed, but it is certainly not like the whole story. And it's not what I would call the heart of medicine. And I think a lot of what you're talking about are ways that, we help to um, sort of almost point, like I almost wanna show like an arrow pointing towards a heart would be my image on this of like, there's a person in there with a beating heart, you know, yeah. has feelings and thoughts and let's hold that too while we're taking care of them. Yeah, absolutely. And even I just was thinking like, it's sort of lighthearted to say like, oh, I really like Bob Dylan, but it could be some stuff that's really much more uh, meaningful and necessary. Like I remember that, I had to get uh, my appendix out when one of my children was only three months old. And I was so concerned about going in to get my appendix out in an emergency surgery, but I was even more concerned that my kids were okay back at home, kind of in a quick, like I just had to, I just had to go that day. So I just left them with the people that were there and I was had to hope they were all right. And if the, if the staff that was checking me in there, like they could see me, they would think I was really nervous and afraid about my appendix. But actually I wasn't at all worried about that. I knew I was in good hands with that surgeon. I was worried about my kids at home. Mm. So, if they could understand a little bit, maybe someone who's a new admission to a new residence seeming you know, upset or stressed, and they might assume like, oh, it's probably something to do with me or these new surroundings, or they didn't like the food or something's wrong with their medicine. Maybe it would just be helpful to know like, 
you know, they, they have a dog and now their dog, they had to leave the dog because they moved to this new place. So maybe that little picture shows like, you know, they, they have a dog and maybe that person can say, well, how's, how's your dog doing in, in the new place that they're now living or whatever, whatever those things under the surface are that you, you can't see and that are hard to bring up. That's why I think this, this you said in, in admissions or wherever you're using these pictures, the people who are writing those notes down and drawing the pictures should be people who either have an existing relationship of trust with that person who they're um, taking notes on behalf of, or somebody who's really trained to know what to listen for and what to draw, because it really, that stuff under the surface isn't always immediately easy to, it's not easy to see, and it might not be easy for that person to even share or realize that that's what's on their mind. So you have to tease out a little under the surface to get that information, but once you can get at a little bit of it, it can open so many doors. Yeah, and honestly, what I'm noticing as we're having this conversation is this really fits into what I would call, you know, kind of family systems medicine, right? So a way in which um, we could shift our systems of medicine, particularly Western medical uh, traditions to uh, move away from notions of individualized patients and move towards uh, sort of family systems thinking where we look at an individual within not only the context of their uh, personal life, but also their the family in which they live and also all their loved ones as an extension of that. So like the dog, like the kids, right? <laughs> all the other pieces that you might be really concerned about that can affect your um, individual treatment plan. And so if, again, all these like redesigns that we're going to build into our healing center, because that's where we have the power to change it. Um, but, you know, the capacity to look at an individual within a, the context of a family, within the context of a community, and how all of those people and um, resources inform how they heal. And I think, you know, that's, that's critical actually. I think that's where graphic medicine can help. Like there's one other graphic medicine uh, kind of, I guess something else that's important in this field that I didn't mention. And that's the use of graphic medicine as what's called a graphic pathography. So it's just a story about illness that's told with pictures and the, I was mentioning how one value is that this can be really useful as a record of, you know, some, some uh, development milestones or some symptoms or whatever, but it can also be useful because when the patient draws it themselves, you see things the way the patient sees them. Mm. So say you're told like, draw a picture of your, you know, how your health journey has been, like, what's your experience with this illness or how was your day, whatever the story is about. Maybe that person draws themselves in the middle of the panel, looking, you know, happy, centered, you know, they're the main character, they're the main thing. But maybe they might draw a big panel, like a comic strip panel, and they may draw themselves off to the side or off in the corner really small. And, you know, you, you're not going to make that as a conscious decision when you're drawing a picture of yourself. You're going to draw it the way you, you may, the way you're thinking of it in that moment, even if it's just a stick figure. But even the way you do that, is it a shaky line? Is it a confident line? Is it a short story? Is it a long story? That will tell the people who are reading that story something about the person who's, who's writing that down and drawing it. And so it's a little opportunity to glimpse how the patient, how the patient themselves is experiencing the situation. And that can be another thing that, um, you know, all the medical information in your chart might not convey, but a picture might. Mm. I am so happy you brought that up because I, I could see how much could be revealed from those images. Um, yeah, I could see that as a very useful healing tool. We've worked a lot with play therapy where kids will use, you know, different little, you think of them as like toys, but they're actually conveying in such a potent way, their story through little figures, you know, little animals. And they'll often use like a sand tray and we'll get to see what the kids, how they convey their experience through using these little objects, little figures. And it's, a, it's really beautiful how much gets revealed in that way. Yeah. But in a way that feels, you know, not threatening to the person who has to do it. And, you know, some people are, you know, nervous about drawing pictures. They feel kind of intimidated or whatever. But as long as it can be explained, like this isn't about some picture you're going to hang on your wall in an art museum. It's just about, you know, telling this, uh, you know, it's like just the same as you tell me how you were doing today with words. Just show it with some images instead. There's even some some uh, exercises where you can um, tell this kind of story without 
representational artwork. So you don't have to try to draw a person or, you know, an ambulance or a house or any of those, like, those things that appear in the story. You might just write some shapes and lines like, how was your morning? Maybe the morning goes along smooth and you have a smooth little line, but then maybe you get a big scribbly, you know, wavy, sharp edged line when you're talking about how the part was when you got to the hospital or whatever, whatever uh, the experience was. Then people are often a lot less intimidated to try to represent something in an artistic form, but they're still using visuals in a way that gets it out of your system and that may still actually convey something to the person who's looking at it. That's great. Um, I want to take like a quick aside because I think it's a cool aside, Sam. Um, which is you had mentioned to me that you actually have something that's called synesthesia, which I had read <laughs> a book on this many years ago. And I was like, oh, it's so, I loved it. I was like, oh, this is so fascinating. Um, and basically for our listeners who've never heard what the heck is synesthesia, um, essentially it's when you experience one of your senses through another, like through another one of your senses. Um, and I know for you, you actually associate letters with particular colors. And so maybe we'll do a whole episode just on synesthesia in the future and, you know, how, what that tells us about <laughs> who we are and how we experience the world very differently. But um, I, I thought it would be fascinating just for our listeners to learn a tiny bit about how that affects you in your kind of day-to-day -day living, you know? <laughs> Yeah, a lot. And I didn't know until I was in my 20s that not everyone had synesthesia because I just didn't talk about it. I didn't tell everybody that, of course, when you see a letter S, it's red. And if you see a letter, you know, whatever letter of the alphabet has a color associated with it. And it, you know, it's a, just sort of a background thing that doesn't you know, affect anything that you do. But, um, well, actually for me, it was, and I'm not sure if I shared this before, but um, when I was in my 20s, I really wanted to change my last name. And I always uh, had wanted to for a few different personal reasons. But one of the reasons that when people asked me, like, why would you like to change your last name? I mentioned my reasons and I also included, and of course, you know, the color of my last name, I've just, I've hated it all my life. It was like this orange and purple mix. <laughs> and every time I said and wrote my last name, I just had this like unpleasant association of color that I didn't like. And that's when people were like, wait a minute, your last name has colors? And I was like, yeah, of course, doesn't your last name have colors too? Or any, any word? Not everybody had that. So then when I picked a new last name, my last name's Hester, I made sure that I chose a name that was meaning to, meaningful to me for other reasons, but also that it happened to be a nice kind of rusty red brown color, kind of like the wall that's behind me over here. That's a color I really like. So now every time I hear my name, I think, oh, that nice color. So yeah, it's just something that doesn't have any meaning. Like lots of people have synesthesia of all different kinds. Like when you hear a certain sound, it's associated with a smell, or maybe when you taste something, it you think of a certain like a, ta a tactile feeling. So it's just like a crossing of the wires of two different senses. But for me, it just happens to have these colors and it's really useful as a, as a memory tool. Maybe this is one of the reasons why I felt that um, um, using pictures can be helpful for, you know, as, as a memory tool in other, in other contexts like we've been discussing. Because I know really firsthand if you have, for example, somebody whose name I can't remember, but I know like, okay, I know their name was green. So I know it's got to start with J, V, P, or D, because those are the green letters. And then it just narrows it down right there. So having a color along with whatever other things you're using to try to have a handle on remembering something, a color can just be helpful. And the other thing that's cool for our listeners to know is the colors are not universal from person to person. Yeah, yeah. definitely not. So yeah. another person might see the same letter in a different shade, like in a different color altogether. Um, so yeah, there's so much to this. I think the book I read years ago, we will see, maybe we can put it in the show notes, but I think it was the man who tasted shapes and I okay. believe like he would taste, you know, like triangles or circles. So food, it had literally like these specific different types of food had a very specific shape associated with it for him. Yeah. There's a podcast I've heard about it too, that maybe afterwards I could share it um, mm -hmm. for your listeners too. Cause yeah. there's lots of, there's been, I think in the last maybe 10 or 20 years some investigation into synesthesia like there's some scientific studies about it that it's a thing that people have got but yeah like what purpose does it serve like for me it's been helpful as a reminder tool but it's also just adds just adds color and fun and right and uh you know some extra extra level of something to your experience that to your life fun. exactly yeah exactly and it makes me argue with my kids because they all think the letters are different colors than the ones I think <laughs> they have their own ideas they definitely do it. yeah <laughs> Great. Um, well, as we start to uh, bring our dialogue together and tie things up, um, I wanted to 
kind of bring you towards this sense of, you know, within the context of your work, within the field of graphic medicine and your artistry, um, how have you, and also just through your own personal experience of the medical journey you've gone on and gone through with your mom, how have you come to understand what healing is? Hmm. Yeah, that's a big question. I don't, I don't know if I have really understood what that is. Cause I'm, I'm a, I think I've been a family caregiver for such a long time. I think, think I'm the, I usually feel myself to be in the role of the person who has to be thinking ahead, what might go wrong? You know, what do we have to be prepared for? What might be the worst case scenario we have to be, you know, ready to face. And so I'm good at thinking ahead of the rotten stuff that might happen. And my, I've actually been grappling a lot in the pandemic uh, in the last couple of years, thinking about like, how do people go ahead with things? How do they move forward in a good way when they know things are going to be hard? Mm. Like say you have Parkinson's or say you have some chronic health condition or some, you know, something that's challenging coming up. How do you still get out of bed and do all that stuff you've got to do in a way that isn't just going through the motions, but actually has a good quality of life? And my mom's been a good example of that because she has a really great attitude. She always seems to find positive and make jokes about stuff and not think too much about the negatives, even though she's living with like really serious health conditions that are make things pretty hard for her and has for a long time. So I almost feel like that might be my definition of healing is the the way like, you know, maybe some things will never be entirely healed. You know, some some medical conditions you might always live with or some challenges will always be there. But the ability to live gracefully and peacefully and happily through that stuff. I think that's about as, as healed as maybe I would aspire to be, or that that's what I'm working on for myself right now. Anyway, I don't know if that answers your question. That's that absolutely does. That's a beautiful answer. Um, I mean, especially, especially given that we all have a terminal diagnosis already, right? You just don't <laughs> right. <know> when <laughs> if you take it to the if you take it to the farthest degree, that's where I usually go. Like, what's the point? It's all going to be. There's going to be inevitable, you know, challenges somewhere. Right. But like we still have this time here while we're here. We have to do something about it. Yeah, and and so thank you for sharing that. I think that was actually a, a absolutely lovely definition of what healing is, and and very personal to you and and your life's work and experience. So. Sam, I know we're going to try to bring you back to do like actually a really short healing moment with our listeners, um, where hopefully we'll do a little bit of drawing practice so that people can actually get a hands-on sense of um, how to do some of this personally for themselves. But I think you gave a lot of great tips and ideas on just remember, it could be as simple as a stick figure. We don't have to go crazy here. So, you know, no pressure. Um, And I think that there's just tremendous value in what you were able to see and notice could be helpful, particularly, you know, um, from my point of view in kind of medical or healthcare settings and how this could actually be a transformative tool in, in many of those settings and really could very positively impact the patient experience. So Thank you. Oh, that's that's my big hope. I'm so grateful for for that to be uh, something that you know people would consider because we all have we all bring something of value. Like the people who have the lived experience of their own health situation, the patient or the family members, that's something that's increasingly valued in healthcare. And I've seen this movement happening all over the place. That uh, this is bringing you know improvements to the ability uh, of the care the, the caregivers, the healthcare team to do their work and to make better outcomes. So if those lived experience people, the patients and the family members also bring some creative pictures and visuals. If that's something that's now, you know, something considered that could be allowed, it could be permitted in a healthcare setting. We've got another whole toolkit of stuff that could help us tell those stories and to uh, just make some shortcuts through all that challenging, you know, process of figuring out what to do on the healthcare journey and get to where we want to be. Mm-hmm. Cheers. Here's to that. I'm for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for spending time with me today on the Conversations on Healing podcast. And it was just great to learn more about you and your work and the impact that I think you're making on the world. So thank you, Sam. 
No, thanks for such a boost today. I really appreciate it. I'm really glad to be here to talk with you today. Thanks a lot. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Conversations on Healing podcast. If you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast platform and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. It helps so you won't miss an episode. See you next time.